trying to get this podcast, get this show right for everybody. So, I, I'm popping in at the beginning of this video just to say the podcast is available on Spotify. So, go down there if you in the description if you would like to just listen to it. If you like to watch it, you know, just keep, stay on YouTube. But it should be on all podcast platforms pretty soon. But it's on Spotify for right now. So go down there if you want to listen to it right now. All right, enjoy. Hey guys, I'm your host, Mason Ball. I'm joined here with my producer, Anthony Marti, and a very special guest. He's a host of the Border Patrol on Sports Radio 810 and one of the biggest personalities in Kansas City sports media. It's Steven St. John. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. How, how have you been today? You know what? It's been a good day. I, uh, we had a good show and then I actually got out and walked around a little bit. I, uh, I tore a ligament in my ankle a couple of weeks ago. So I've been in a walking boot. And so I got a chance to kind of get out and stretch my legs a little bit. So, uh, a beautiful day outside. So it's been a good day, man. Awesome. Awesome. So I'm going to jump right into the questions here. First, I'd like to ask, how did you get your start in sports journalism? Boy, that's a, are you ready for a long answer? I got, yes, I got a lot. So, yeah. so um, how I first started, I was uh, going to school up at, up at St. Joe, at Missouri Western State University. And I was walking around campus and there was up on the bulletin board where they posted for jobs around campus. There was a, there was a, a posting for a sports columnist at the Griffin News, which is the campus newspaper. And so that's something I'd always wanted to do. And I was just a, a, a freshman up there. I said, you know what? Why not? I'll try it out. Went in there. They, they didn't have anybody that wanted to write about sports. And, and the sports editor didn't really know anything about sports. He was just doing it for credit, uh, credit hours. And so he said, yeah, write a col- you can write about whatever you want. We don't care. And so I didn't even write about like campus sports or, or, or Mo West. I would write about the Chiefs. I'd write about the Royals. And so uh, that got me wanting to, to be in sports media somehow. I ended up transferring to UMKC, and I was uh, one of the student managers for the basketball team. But then I also was the sports editor for the U News at UMKC. And that's what really got me started. I actually wrote for a couple of small newspapers when I first graduated from college. But uh, I always wanted to be in radio. And so uh, while I was a junior and senior in college, I was also a, a boxer. And so I fought in the Golden Gloves in Kansas City, and then I turned bro- pro and won my first pro fight. But then I graduated from college, and I had uh, promised my mom if I graduated with a college degree, I wouldn't fight anymore. And I was getting ready to have uh, my first son, too. So I, I stopped boxing, and uh, I-, I used my connections in boxing to go to Chad Boger, who owns Sports Radio 1510, and I proposed that I, w- I could do a weekly boxing show the casinos had w- monthly boxing events. And I said, they would, they would uh, advertise. I could get all the local boxers. And so that was my, and, and I had to ask them about probably 50 times over the course of a month. I just would, you know, I'd send them emails. I'd send them letters just to try to get my foot in the door. And then before you knew it, I was doing a weekly boxing segment and I got a sponsor Then I was doing a weekly boxing show. And then uh, when an opening came up for the nighttime show in 1999, I got it. And 21 years later, I'm still there. It's crazy. That's awesome. That's really, it's really, I like like the whole, you emailed him a million times, like you were just yeah. trying to get it and that's how you got into it. So being in journalism or something similar is my dream job. So what would you say to me or another high school kid like me that wants to be in your position? Well, number one, uh, y- you have to believe in yourself because you're going to hear a lot of no's and you're going to have a lot of roadblocks put up. It's very competitive uh, in, in sports media, uh, but it's, it's, it's people that persevere and are willing to take constructive criticism and not be deterred by hearing a no or uh, and honestly not be deterred by failure because you're going to face that. You're going to face adversity in this business. But I, I would tell you to, to intern intern at a, at, at a radio station, intern at a TV station, intern at a newspaper, because you may know that you want to get into sports media, but there's different facets of sports media. And like, you know, you're, you're doing this podcast and, and you're on YouTube and you're doing things that 
I mean, we didn't do 10, 15 years ago or 20 years ago when I started. And so the more, the, the more versatile you can be to learn to do different things, to produce, to cut sound, to run the camera, uh, all of it, the more experience you can have, uh, the more valuable you're going to be uh, to a radio station or, or, or whatever you're, you're trying to do. But I would say intern as much as you can, job shadow, try to get that type of experience so you'll know that's truly what you want to do and just never give up, man. There'll be times, there were times in my life early on in my career, I thought there's no way I'm going to make it. There's no way I'm going to have my own show. Then I got my own show. There's no way I'll get to the morning show. And that's what I wanted to do. And ultimately that's what I did. And, you know, it, it looking back, it, it, people probably think, well, you know, he, he probably always thought he was going to make it. No, I didn't, I didn't really feel like I'd made it in this business until probably like seven or eight years at the radio station. And I really felt like, okay, I made it. I'm here. I'm doing the morning show. And so I, I would just say, man, an unwavering belief in yourself and, and, and never, never take no for an answer, man. Just keep, keep working. And, and that's the other thing. The last thing, work ethic. You know, uh, you're, you're always going to find somebody more talented than you, uh, but you don't have to find somebody that, that works harder than you. You control that. You can work harder, outwork everybody, and, and you'll always, I think, put yourself in a good position. Yeah, it's easy to say once once like someone like you is in their position to say like, oh, I mean, you know, there, at, at some point it's hard to imagine that you didn't have a chance, you know, for for people. Oh, of- yeah. I, hey, I mean, like, you know, I, I started off and I was part time and I didn't have a show and I was sometimes I would just volunteer. I would drive. I drove a, a produce truck, a fruit truck uh, in, in the morning. And, and you know, I had a, had a wife and I had a, a little baby boy. And, and then I would just go and basically intern for free just to try to pick up knowledge around the radio station. And it was Sports Radio 1510 then. And then it became Sports Radio 810 under under the umbrella of Union Broadcasting. But, um, you know, and, and then I once I got the nighttime show, I was kind of unsure and I didn't know if I was going to make it. And then back then, Jason Whitlock uh, hosted our morning show and he needed a co-host. And he I didn't realize that he listened to my nighttime show all the time and liked me and liked my show and asked me to, to be his co-host. And so I moved up and that really, that really catapulted me. Uh, and so I, I, uh, I, I, I owe him a, a debt of gratitude for giving me my first crack in the mornings. And that was in the year 2000. And so that, uh, uh, that really paid off. And I made that, uh, made that work for me. What well, well, you said uh, segues really well into my next question. So it was, you have a primetime spot on 810 because the, the morning drive and the evening drive were the biggest, biggest booms for radio. So you, maybe you, Katie, and Jake Gutierrez have worked a lot to get to that spot. So where do you go from here? Like you're at a position in your radio station where you have the top. So what is your. It sounds like you want me to leave 810. Is that, is that what you're <laughs> saying? I'm almost offended by that question. Um, you, you know, that's actually, that's a really interesting question. Because some people that have been in Kansas City use this market as a springboard to either try to go national or, or go to another city. Uh, you know, I mean, Nick Wright's obviously very successful. He was local and now is, is national. You've seen uh, a, a couple of different guys do that. Um, but for me, I'm a, I'm a lifelong Kansas Cityan, right? I got, I got five kids. Uh, I'm, I'm married. This is where I grew up. This is where I live. Uh, my lived my whole life. Um, I love the Chiefs. I love the Royals. Uh, th- this is uh, I'm in love with the city, and so this is this is it for me. I mean, I I've also I ring announced for for MMA and some boxing, and I can do things like that uh, to kind of to kind of scratch my itch if I ever feel like I'm 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 getting doing this. You know, I, I've never really feel bored, but if I feel like I want to do something that, that adds some excitement, I'm able to do that. But I love my job so much and this was my goal to do morning uh morning radio in kansas city uh since i was a kid and so uh i mean i'm i'm, I'm happy i'm happy here and i've had opportunities uh to to go to, to chicago i've had uh opportunity at least to go out and, and people in denver were interested in me i could never do a show in denver talking about the broncos i <laughs> want to pass out every day and hit myself yeah. in the face with a microphone but it's just uh i love kansas city I love, uh, you know, the, the, the company I work with is locally owned and operated. And that's awesome. And so, it, you know, it sounds crazy, but I am 47 years old. I'm glad I figured it out by now. 
but no, this is uh, this is my dream job, and I'm just lucky to have it, man, for real. So, with with all the different, you mentioned this earlier, with all the different facets of media now, what do you think about the longevity of radio, and how long do you do you think that podcast will take over AM radio at any point in the near future? Um, not in the near future, but I mean, at, at some point, terrestrial radio is going to be obsolete. Um, I mean, at some point, like local, local sports, uh, you know, sports casts on the, on the news are going to be obsolete. Um, I mean, you can get everything, uh, I mean, whenever you want it, uh, whether it's, you know, news direct from players and people on Twitter. I mean, that's where I get all my news on my show prep. Um, you know, like all the, all the, the, such a wide variety of podcasts, uh, satellite radio. Uh, there's so many, so many different avenues. And yet at some point, eventually I do think terrestrial radio will be obsolete, but especially in Kansas city, there's such a love affair with, the teams here it's such a great pro town it's such a great college town i think there's always going to be a spot for a hometown radio station in a, in a town like kansas city like sports radio 810 i mean could you imagine not having local sports talk like during the chiefs playoff run and the super bowl and having us down there it's one thing to listen to national uh you know radio but they don't focus enough uh, uh, on the chiefs or in the midwest yeah. or what we do and the same thing with with the royals i think we we you know, a lot of people experience that through Sports Radio 810, and I'm really proud of that. And so uh, I'm 47. I think I'll be able to get a full career out of it. But then after that, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, in 20, we'll have to do this again in 20 years when you make it famous. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll figure out what happened, huh? Yeah, I interview you on 810 or whatever it is. Yeah, that's that right. Point. So you and other hosts on the radio or TV ha have a radio voice. Have you always had this or how has that developed over the years? I've always had a really loud voice. Uh, always. Uh, well, this may shock some people, but I was always uh, the class clown uh, <laughs> in school. But my mom, from the time I was able to read, she would always make me read out loud. And she was... Uh, she was a perfectionist. She started me in, in kindergarten a year early. Uh, and then eventually in third grade, I started going to Catholic school and she made me sign up to read. Uh, I would always do the first reading or the second reading. I would read at weddings, I'd read at funerals. And so as, as, a, as a young, it's, it's funny, a lot of times you hear about famous singers got their start singing in church. I got my start uh, reading in church in front of a lot of people. And so from the time I was like five or six or seven years old and, and, and I started to get older, I was used to speaking in front of crowds and projecting my voice and entertaining people. My mom used to, when I was seven or eight years old, used to dress me up as Elvis. And I used to do little Elvis shows at weddings. I got a lot of issues, man, trust me. And, but, <laughs> but, and so I, it's like, I had a radio voice when I was, you know, when I was eight, I also had a mustache when I was 10. So it's like, I was a little man walking around, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, I, I've now Nate, I tell him he uses he has a different voice when he does play by play than when he's just like on, on the radio. Like when we do our morning show, it's just us. We don't change yeah. our voice or anything else. But then like when I ring it out, I do, you know, a little bit different, you know, Connor McGregor. And I'm, you know, you know, all into it. But this is just our voice where I'm blessed with uh, with a loud voice, although my wife would probably disagree. She would not call that a blessing. What is something not a lot of people think about with radio with it's in and in and outs and everything because i kind of thought of this question when you were talking about how you record your ads after every show mm -hmm. you know um maybe the biggest misconception is uh hey he's on from 6 a.m until 10 a.m that he's off work and this is just for me for every hour that i'm on the air I, I feel like I have to do an hour of prep. So over the course of the day, and you know what? And that's, that's pretty much even a lie too. Cause my family will tell you, I'm, my mind is always rolling, looking for things and looking for topics to talk about. Cause on my show, it's not just totally sports. I'll talk about my family. I'll talk about what I watch on TV. I'll talk about, you know, I, I try to, I try to uh, make people laugh. And so 
I feel like I'm always prepping for the show. But but if you if you really sat down or narrowed it down, the way I look at it is four hour show. I probably do you know three to four hours of prep. Um, and, and so I, I don't go in there with a stack of papers or reading from a script because I try to keep everything in here. I've got a pretty good uh, short term retention, long term that's out the window. Uh, but the other thing I think that really uh, the people don't get is is it's just like the, the how, how much time it takes, um, not only with the prep, but then like recording commercials and meeting with clients. And I do a lot of appearances and I'm really proud that I'm involved with a lot of charities. And so and then covering games and then, you know, I got to get up at 430 a.m. If there's if, if there's a West Coast game for the Royals, it ends at 1230 or one. I still got to stay up and watch it because I have to talk about it. And so. I'll average three or four hours of sleep. But let me tell you something. Again, I love my job. And so it's really not like it's work. It's like it's uh, it's something that I'm passionate about. And that's that's another thing that bit of advice I would give you. As long as you love what you do and you and you love being uh, a part of the sports media or covering sports or doing a talk show or doing a podcast, man, that's half the battle because it doesn't matter how much money you get paid. If, if you if you don't love what you do, if you're miserable with your job, you won't enjoy life. And so I love my job. I enjoy life and everything else is secondary, man. Yeah. I, I like that a lot. So uh, you, you mentioned this in your answer. So with, with there being Royals games on other coasts and chief Sunday night games and playoff games that you have to stay up and watch, especially on Sundays. So what is, what is your schedule like throughout the week? Like uh, it's with, all over the place. You, you have to wake up at four thirty. How do you? How, if if you have a game to watch, how do you handle that? Well, um, like I said, usually at night I, I average four to five hours of sleep, or so something or something around there. Maybe I can get six if there wasn't a game the night before. Haven't had that problem lately because there's been no sports, but. I, I try to get a nap afterwards after I get home. I've been working at home uh, for the past three or four months and doing the show just uh, in my office. And so that's helped a lot because I live 45 minutes away from the radio station. So I spend an hour and a half, uh, you know, round trip uh, every day in the car. But um, I, I, I try to take a nap to catch up usually around noon, one or two o'clock. Cause I kind of hit a wall there, you know, getting up at four, four thirty, but Honestly, you, you really don't ever catch up sleep, catch up on the weekend. And then after you do it for so long, you get adjusted to it. It's probably not healthy, not sleeping that, that much. And I try to catch up with it. But I've been doing this now. I've been doing early mornings since, like I said, for 20 years. And so uh, it, it's the but, but one thing that does help me, um, I'm, I'm very organized with my time. And so I'll have and I use an old school planner that, that you know, that has the seven, seven days of the week out. And the time from 8 a.m. down to 8 p.m. And I write everything out and I make sure that I allot the right amount of time for everything that I do or I'll get overwhelmed and I'll forget stuff. And so I'm very detail oriented and very organized with my time. And that helps me because if you don't if you don't control your schedule, you can get uh, especially in my job, it can get overwhelming. Right. I'm sure that's crazy. With like how early you have to wake up. Yeah. So. Are, are you inspired by other podcasts and shows? Like what other shows do you listen to outside of 810 in your show? Um, the person that is, uh, I think, influenced me most and that I've most enjoyed listening to over my life would be Howard Stern. Um, and, and Howard Stern, I think, gets gets a bad rap for you know, just being a guy that tells fart jokes and sophomore humor and everything else. But I maintain there is nobody in media, sports, me, any media that is better at interviewing celebrities or interviewing anyone, interviewing people from a former president to the biggest rock star, the biggest movie star, any athletes doesn't matter. He is able to interview people and get the most out of them and make them feel comfortable and ask questions in a way that other interviewers can't. And I've always been fascinated by that. And I've tried to take uh, some of the stuff, the, the humor stuff. And, and you know, I, I, I do think he's funny. And I think I've, I've probably, uh, I've probably stolen some things from him over the years, but 
his interview, uh, his interviews, his ability to interview people and get the best answers out of them. I've always, always looked at him as, as the gold standard. And so, yeah, he's, he's probably my biggest influence in radio and someone that I have uh, absolutely uh, just loved listening to over the years. And it's helped me become a better interviewer as well. Awesome. Awesome. So this is a complete 180. I'm going to, this question is not connected to that at all. So a lot of listeners of the show have heard a lot about your dad. He's had a lot of influence on you, obviously. Yeah. So I've, some things I've read, you've mentioned about him that he had a fling with Janice Joplin. Yes. So what is, what is your immediate reaction when you hear of her or one of her songs? So it's funny. Uh, so my mom and dad uh, split up when I was 11 or 12, right? And it wasn't, it was not a good split up. And so my mom was, whenever she'd hear my dad, she'd always, you know, she'd have something to say and she'd just be mad about, you know, something or whatever. Um, and, and I remember even when they were together, whenever a Janis Joplin song would come on or she'd come on TV, my mom would get so mad and she'd just say, so, you know, she looks so dirty or I hate her voice. Does she have and just I go, gosh, my mom really hates Janice Joplin. And so my mom, my mom passed away in 2006. And then uh, somehow I don't remember how it came up, but my dad told me the story about Janice Joplin. And I go, and, and my mom knew that, right? And he goes, Yeah, I go, that's why she always hated Janice Joplin. I, <laughs> and, you know, and so my dad, you know, when he was in California and he was, he went. He was in the Navy and was getting ready to leave and because uh, he served three years in the Navy in the Vietnam War. He met her in the Tenderloin District in San Francisco and had a brief fling with her. And it's the weirdest thing in the world. Like, if you ever saw my dad, like, I like I don't think of my dad having a fling with anyone, much less Janis Joplin. And so it's like, <laughs> it's, it's like so weird, but, but true. So like, that's it. Whenever I, whenever I hear Janis Joplin, because I do like Janis Joplin. I just kind of laugh, man. And I try not to think about her kissing my dad or something. Then I, want to turn the, <laughs> then I want to turn the song off. In that same interview, I was in Kansas City. I, they asked you the question, who's the bigger rock star, Elvis or Patrick Mahomes? And your answer was Elvis. But if Mahomes wants a Super Bowl for the Chiefs, come find me. So yeah. would you now say that Patrick Mahomes is a bigger rock star than Elvis Presley? In this town, yes. In Kansas City, yeah. yes. Hey. Elvis didn't get a five hundred and three million dollar contract, although he could have probably. But yeah, yeah, you know, I, I've never seen anything like it. I'm gonna tell you, man, I've never seen it, and I love Elvis, and that's that's kind of why I made that comparison. But let me tell you, I've been doing this for twenty years, I never thought I'd see anything like Patrick Mahomes, and it's just and and it's one of those things now. Like I told you, how much I love what I do and love doing it here in Kansas City. Can you imagine how upset or heartbroken I'd be if I'd have left? and gone someplace else, and I would have missed Mahomes, and I would have missed being ever all that stuff. I'm so thankful. It's like all the garbage football I watched for 20 years paid off in the last two or three. So, yeah, he's the biggest rock star in the world. Him and Jack White, and that's it. Mm, okay. So, I know you're in contact with a lot of very famous people, especially in sports. And this year, I, I've had two, like, cool, like, celebrity meetings, I guess. So I I have a picture with Sammy Watkins at the Super Bowl parade, yeah. and you you know you know the Marlins man, yeah. I was at a Kansas basketball game, and he was there, and me and my friends went and got a picture with him. There and you I'm go. Not, not not a Kansas fan, by the way. I just got invited for free. That was good. So so what, so, what, who, so who are you a fan of? What school are you a fan of then? Uh, Mizzou. Okay, there. You, all right. Yeah, my, I was gonna say was, Mizzou earlier, but I didn't know if I should say anything. So yeah, I'm a. I graduated oh, yeah. from UNKC, but I'm a lifelong Mizzou fan, so let's go. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what is your biggest moment meeting or, be able to, or being able to talk to a celebrity that you look up to? Oh, wow. Wow. It was before – well, it's okay. So growing up, my hero was George Brett. And now mm -hmm. I've, made, I've done many events with George Brett. I'm on the board of directors for the ALS Association. Because my my uncle, who was a KCK police officer, uh, died from ALS when he was 39. And George Brett, that's the main charity he's involved with. And so I, I, I do the, the 
ALS golf tournament with him. Um, I've, I've done many events with him, so I've, I've gotten to know him very well, and that just blows my mind. I still get nervous when I'm around him because that was my that was my favorite player in the world. Um, I met Muhammad Ali before he passed away, and I don't think that I've ever been so nervous as to meet somebody as I was Muhammad Ali because, again, I, he was one of my heroes growing up. Um, those two would have to be – number one and number two right there. One more, you know, obviously on a local level, but when I was a kid, George Brett was, was Superman to me. Um, and then, uh, and then, like I said, Muhammad Ali, uh, I mean, if you pick the five most famous athletes in the history of the world, he's, he's one of them and he might be number one. Uh, but uh, that, that was, that was probably the coolest thing, uh, coolest athlete, coolest celebrity I've ever met. Yeah. Muhammad Ali, that's a big answer. Like I, I expect you to have a big one, but Muhammad Ali is insane. Oh yeah. Especially I was a boxing fan. I was so nervous. I didn't know what to do. And I, it was actually with my mom and he was, it was, he was at a, he was at a department store. Uh, Cause he had come out with Muhammad Ali cologne. And so if you, if you stood in line and you bought uh, the cologne, then you got to meet him. And so we stood in line for like three hours. And I think we we're going to get there. We got up there and I was like, oh, uh, I didn't even know what to say. Uh, I like you very much. I said, I sound like I was from another country. I was like, ah, I was, I was speaking like Borat. I was good. Very nice. <laughs> and so then, and so he, and he knew, he knew I was uh, nervous. So he goes, take a picture. I said, yeah, he grabs my hand and puts my fist on his face like that. And we took a picture like that. Oh, and I awesome. can't find the picture. I'll find it somewhere, somewhere in my basement. But yeah. And the whole time I'm like, oh, and that is then so I, cool. you know, and I walk off and like, I thought of all the things I wanted to tell him that I forgot because I was so nervous. I'm stupid, but well, I, I'm, I'm going to round it out here with, I think some, something similar to what Seren Pedro has, like just some quick questions at the end. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you if you were offered $503 million to broadcast for a 10 for the next 10 years, is that, is that an easy deal you would think? Yeah. I, I might do it for $503. Yeah, exactly. Be, you know? Yeah. Yes. Well, do you think you could rank your five favorite sports? <sighs> Boxing, number one. NFL football, number two. Is college football, can I just say football or do I have to separate NFL and college football? Whatever. I think uh, you, could, you could just say football. Okay. Boxing, one. Football, two. Uh, MMA, three. Ah, basketball four, baseball five. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm yeah, sure you works. might may have seen this because you're on Twitter. So there's this tw there's a trend where people explain their favorite sports moment, but in boring <laughs> terms. So I I wrote one for the jet ship loss play in the Super Bowl. So I said Tyreek Hill runs a long way forward, runs back a little, then catches a pass. So. <laughs> Do you think you could uh, think of a one of your favorite sports moments and describe it in the most boring terms? Yeah, let's see. Um, Damian Williams runs real fast and makes me cry. <laughs> because that happened. Because on that last touchdown, I'm standing there in the stadium, and, I'm, and, and I know that no matter if they win or lose, I have to go interview people after the game. And I have to compose myself. It's okay. And Todd Lebo from the station is right next to me. And he goes, you better not cry. So leave me alone, dude. Leave me alone. Telling me not to cry is worse because it'll make me cry. And then as soon as Damian Williams scores a touchdown, then you realize that she's going to win. And it yeah. tears down my face. And Lebo's calling me an idiot. So it was great. It was awesome. Yeah. That's a beautiful moment. That's right. All right. Well, I, I don't have any more questions, so – Thank you for coming on, man. It was I. It's I'm kind of been star starstruck the whole time because like I half the half of the mornings like in my life have probably been consisted of you, Nate Bukay, Jake Gutierrez talking on the, the radio, playing in my dad's truck, playing you know wherever I am. Me listening to your podcast and everything the last year or so. So I how really old are you? It, man. I'm fifteen. So how old are you? Fifteen. 15. And so yeah. be honest. So, so when, when you first started listening, your dad made you listen. Did you yeah. want to listen? Were you in on it? You're like, oh, come on. And then you started yeah, to like it. I, like, be, tell the truth. For, for a while, I was like, 
I, I kind of thought talk radio was like, why would you just want to listen to people talk? I've heard a lot of people <laughs> say that. Yeah, I know. But once I, I feel that way, to... I feel that way whenever Nate's talking. Like, I don't want to listen to him talk anymore, you know? <laughs> yeah. Once I, once I started, you know, venturing out from cartoons and getting a bit more into sports, it did get more interesting because you guys would also – it's not like you guys were completely serious and talked about stat lines and everything. You guys would joke about players and their personalities and things like that. So I, from, I was probably a pretty young age from maybe from when I was like 11 or, or 10, I was a fan of you guys and knew your names and everything. Well, that's awesome, man. I appreciate that. And that's like, that's like the coolest thing that I ever hear when someone comes up to me and says, I grew up listening to you or listening to you makes me think of driving to school with my dad. I hear that all the time uh, that from, from kids that, that uh, started to listen to us driving to school with one of their parents. And like, that's the coolest thing ever because uh, you know, that means you liked it and you liked it enough to stick with it. So I appreciate it. Anytime you want me to come back on, you can, uh, you can have me as a regular guest. And so whenever, man, just let me know. Yeah. I'd love to have you as a recurring guest, especially if this grows a little bit and I can talk to you more about it. So. I appreciate it, man. Thank you for coming on. And remember, you're only as good as your producer. Like, <laughs> like Jake's great and Jake makes us great. I like this. I like your producer. He knows what he's doing. All right. So you stick with him. All right. All I right, appreciate fellas. it. All right, man. Thank you. Are we good? Yeah, I think we're, we're good. good. Awesome. All right. All right. Great.